Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those of you not joining us here on the West Coast. My name is Jennifer Bennett. I'm the Senior Manager of Education and Training here at Volunteer Match. And I want to welcome you to our nonprofit insight series, Making Big Bets, How Changes in Volunteer Engagement Strategies Pay Off. Joining me this morning are Beth Steinhorn and Carla Lane. Both ladies this morning are contributors to our new book, Volunteer Engagement 2.0, and they're going to join us today to talk a little bit about the chapters that they've written, as well as to have a conversation with all of you about your questions on how some of the volunteer engagement strategies that they talk about can really make a big difference in your program, even if they don't feel like fundamental changes. Before I turn it over, I did want to introduce both Beth and Carla. Beth is currently the president of JF Fixler Group, and she's written many articles and books on uh, Boomer volunteer engagement, and that's what she's going to be talking about with us today. Also joining us this morning is Carla Lane, and she's the library programs consultant for the California State Library, and uh, she has also worked with Volunteer Match quite a bit on working with Boomer volunteers, working with volunteers in skills-based uh, positions, and um, really building impact-driven volunteer opportunities. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Beth. Um, we did have some technical difficulties this morning, so we missed about a minute of Beth's presentation, but all of Carla's presentation and our conversation is available uh, in the following recording. Thank you so much. What did we expect from them in the nonprofit sector? The baby boomer generation was certainly known by a lot of different ways to slice and dice these 76 to 80 million individuals. They were certainly known by their efforts in the 1960s to change the world, to challenge the status quo. What would that look like now that they were in their 60s? So after their work in, um, uh, in terms of um, uh, challenging status quo, um, fighting for civil rights, for women's rights, throughout the 1960s and early 70s, um, what, what did this generation go ahead and do over the next you know, few decades? They certainly did settle in to careers. They were very work-oriented um, with both men and women actively um, developing a very uh, profound set of work skills and professional experiences. They actually, um, long before technology, made it possible to have social networking, online networking. It was the boomer generation that created networking in terms of professional networking. Um, so they brought with them to the late 2000s um, a profound and robust network of professional connections as well as social connections. This was the first generation that didn't stay in the same job or the same town or, dare I say, even the same marriages. So what would their volunteering look like in their second chapter of life? Would they stay in the same volunteer roles and structures, that, in these structures that were designed to reward retention with 20-year pins and 30-year pins? Or would they move around in their volunteering in the same way that they did professionally? These were some of the questions that were really floating around and challenging the nonprofit sector. So on the next slide, we'll, we'll find out what some of those um, uh, actual expectations were. In anticipation, if you can change the slide on the other hand. Oh, yeah. In it... anticipation of this wealth of talent, we really um, saw around 2005, 2006, 2007, a tremendous number of organizations popping up uh, to help understand the boomer generation and leverage their talent. Organizations like Experience Corps, Civic Ventures, Respectability, all of these organizations and others targeted both sides of the divide, advocating for boomers as well as for organizations that were poised and ready and excited to engage them as volunteers. And a number of studies were commissioned as well. Volunteer Match. 2007 launched a Great Expectations study, and there was 
some others by Civic Ventures in 2005 and AARP in 2007. So they were all designed to understand what do boomers want, what did boomers want in the years ahead. And here's what we learned, that boomers were at that point very optimistic about retirement, that they planned to work in retirement, whether for fun or for necessity, that they, um, while in the early part of the 2000s, um, they were fairly conservative about their um, uh, financial predictions for retirement, and some of that may have had to do with the 2001, um, the 9-11 uh, uh, tragedy, as well as some of the um, financial fallout from uh, after 9-11, which compared to the recession that launched around 2008 like a minor blip, but we didn't know that one was coming. Um, so they were fairly conservative, and then, of course, once that next recession unleashed that financial conservatism, it became more profound. They all really saw, or nearly all, saw volunteering as part of their vision for retirement. More than half planned to volunteer more in retirement, and even more wanted to start volunteering. And what was it that boomers really saw as the defining element in what would make volunteering attractive to them? Skills. Skills, skills, skills. Boomers were very clear that the chance to use their skills or gain new skills would be the key factor in really uh, valuing and feeling valued volunteer experience. And in fact, um, one of the most, to me, still the most interesting pieces of research that came out of this was that boomer men were and remain today very motivated to volunteer by the chance to use their professional skills, while boomer women are especially motivated by the opportunity to gain professional skills through volunteering. So that was the landscape of expectations that we um, were able to glean from the research leading up to and into around 2007. And yet, how did organizations, how were they poised and ready, were they poised and ready to accept and engage boomers on their terms? Um, because boomers clearly were going to be defining retirement. Next slide. And what was became very clear was that nonprofits were not ready to engage them by and large on the terms that boomers were setting. Uh, that nonprofits were not ready in 2007 to engage boomers for their skills with the flexibility that boomers were um, were seeking, um, nor were they ready to really talk about volunteer experiences in the impact, in terms of impact, measurable results, which is what was motivating boomer volunteers. So we were faced with this interesting divide, this gap between how boomers wanted to engage and how nonprofits were poised and ready to engage them. And in fact, um, we were, we, there was an urgency there because nonprofits, whether they were willing to accept it or not, were faced with the reality that if boomers didn't find what they were looking for at your organization, they would take their skills and their time and go elsewhere. So I'd like to share with you a case study of how one organization in particular um, went about proactively addressing this divide and closing the gap between what boomers wanted and how their organization was ready to engage them. And that um, case study I'd like to share is of one um, healthcare facility, a hospital in California, Presbyterian Inter Inter Community Hospital, which has since been rebranded as CIH Health. And um, this was an organization that systematically um, undertook a, a year about an 18-month process that has been continued, and I'll share some of that in a moment, 
satisfy the need. They knew that their volunteer corps was aging and that their current offerings were not attractive to Boomer volunteers. So they formed a team, a, combina a combined staff and volunteer team um, that became the Boomer Engagement Task Force for the hospital. They were very strategic in who they invited in to, um, to populate this team. They included a few individuals who were already connected with the hospital, um, volunteers who were boomers themselves, who were familiar with the hospital and had ideas and leadership skills to share. They also engaged a few new volunteers, including one recently retired COO from another obviously knew the field and had um, a tremendous amount of experience to offer to the process, but couldn't really effectively be a volunteer in his own organization after having led it for so long. Um, and they also included key staff members, um, the director of volunteer services and a few other staff members. So it was a combined staff and volunteer team. They provided that team with training um, by, uh, by experts my, my firm was involved in that, and we provided training, a full day summit, where the org, where this team, the Volunteer Engagement Task Force, was able to learn about rumor engagement trends, assess their own organization, and come up with a plan to really um, make some targeted changes in their organization. And the team was charged with the task of identifying strategic opportunities gave volunteers, boomer volunteers, in new ways and moved the organization forward through these targeted pilots where they could learn what works and what doesn't. Next slide, please. So what does the team do first? This engagement team, this volunteer engagement task force, interviewed staff and found out what are the barriers to um, engaging boomers for their skills flexible position in ways that create measurable impact. They, through that process, identified some policies that were barriers, such as requirements around training and also requirements around um, commitment, how long volunteers were required to sign on. And so in addition to recommending policy changes, they also identified a number of and I'll share with you just a couple that they identified. One of the first ones they, um, they discovered would be really helpful is to create patient biographer positions. These are on the next slide. Oh. Um, and the patient biographers were specifically um, recruited for the purpose of helping create better relationships and experiences for the long-term patients, the patients that were going to be in the hospital for long periods of time, and yet didn't feel that they had any personal relationship with their medical staff. So these biographers came in, interviewed patients, wrote up a short biography, had it vetted by the patient, and then they post that in the room so that the nurses, the interns, the um, phlebotomists, everyone who came in could learn a little bit about a patient and strike up conversation with him or her. And that has really um, positively affected the experience of those long-term patients um, at the hospital. They engage volunteers to help in their volunteer department with um, interviewing potential volunteers, leading orientation. They also engage healthy living educators, volunteers with education backgrounds, medical backgrounds, to help expand their outreach programs and bring programs about healthy living further out in the region um, and building the capacity of that program well beyond the limits of their staff, which was quite small in their education department. So those are just a few examples of four positions that they created. And in preparing for, um, for this chapter, uh, for this book, it was a great opportunity for me to circle back with CIA and find out what has happened in the subsequent two years. And the program has only scaled up. Those pilot positions, those four I, I mentioned, were the foundation that really dramatically shifted how TIA does business. Staff is now regularly and ongoingly approaching the
the volunteer department asking for skilled boomer or skilled volunteers to be done well. And in order to fill that need, they created an initiative called Team 100, where they set out a task of recruiting 100 new skilled boomer volunteers over the course of the year. They engaged boomers as talent scouts to go out and um, pop up this program, do, uh, do recruitment in their communities, and bring back volunteers with skills to become ambassadors, pet therapists, develop surveys and analyze surveys, um, and the list just keeps going on and on. So what are the tips that they provided, TIH provided, um, and that we've seen borne out in a lot of other types of work we've done? First of all, they recommend that any organization wanting to make change and engage skilled volunteers, boomers, or other generations as well, that they first really commit to learning. They get the training they need to understand the landscape um, of the population they're targeting and, um, and really learn about successful models elsewhere. They need to adjust their expectations and understand that it's not going to happen overnight, um, but that if you commit to long-term change and you're patient about it, that you also can expect bigger and better things from your volunteers. They took the time to assess their needs and identify truly strategic roles for volunteers because volunteers can see immediately when their work is busy work. They want work that is meaningful and strategic. And finally, they engaged their champions. They didn't start with the resistors in the organization. They started with staff and departments that were open to change and willing to learn. And it was with those champions they created pilot projects, measured their success, and really um, learned along the way. And that was the foundation for the, uh, for the Team 100 and the multitude of roles that boomers and other skilled volunteers continue today to play at PIH. So with that, I think um, hopefully I've, uh, I've, I've inspired a few questions, which you're welcome to post questions We'll get to those later in the webinar, and I'll turn it back over to Jennifer and Carla, who I think will pick up on some of these themes in the next part of the webinar. Absolutely. So we're going to hear a little from Carla, and then I have some questions for both of you ladies, but I also encourage those of you who are listening to type in those questions. What we're going to hear from Carla today is... Um, Really, I think similar. Um, there's some. There's a nice synergy happening here. So, um, Carla, without further ado, I'm going to pull up your slides and turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Jennifer, and thanks, Beth. And, uh, I think you will see some similarities. We benefited from a lot of the uh, research that you heard Beth uh, mention, and uh, actually engaged uh, Jill Friedman Fixler to come as. Uh, a key part of our initial training process, but um, let me show you how where we've come on this. It's been uh, very exciting. Um, I work at the California State Library, and I've been working with the uh, 1,100 volunteer, uh, excuse me, 1,100 libraries throughout the state of California. We had two goals uh, when we started this. Um, came up with a third one when we started to focus on skills-based volunteering. So our, our idea was to help libraries to increase library volunteers, and as we moved into that recession, it became very critical to have in order to continue to provide uh, not just the same level of service, but the increased demand for service that libraries experienced during the recession when people could no longer you know, go to the bookstore and buy their books, or they no longer had internet access at home. Uh, library service demand increased dramatically. And so we wanted to increase library volunteers. We wanted to help them think about moving beyond their traditional uh, volunteer roles and capture uh, that trend. But uh, Beth mentioned what the baby boomers were up to in terms of wanting to share their skills and see results. Uh, and then we also had sort of a subversive uh, goal, and that was that we know from our own experience that when you bring volunteers into your organization, um, even without meaning to, maybe if you don't focus on it, volunteers often become advocates for your organization because they really see 
uh, the intent and nature of the services you're providing. They get to know your customers or clients. Uh, they understand your uh, the funding issue and other issues that organizations have, and so they, they naturally turn into advocates. And we were we were campaigning for that. That was something we really wanted to do. Uh, and we did that through in three ways. One, we uh, had a very intensive training program up at the beginning. Uh, we formed a partnership with Volunteer Match, and we've done some uh, ongoing support of the libraries who've been doing this with us for the last five years. So we learned um, what works. And some of this is going to sound familiar, but I, I can't say how strongly these things are uh, important in whatever size effort you're implementing, whether you're a statewide organization like me or whether you're a, a nonprofit that has maybe several sites or several departments, I think all of these things relate to, uh, to any kind of change you're trying to make in the volunteer engagement uh, process of your organization. So the first thing we did, and I would highly recommend, is to seek input from the folks that are out there in the field or in your organization before you start laying some big new program on them. It's really important to find out uh, what do they think the issues are, what do they think the needs are, and where do they think the barriers might be uh, in trying to implement this. Um, we developed a statewide um, advisory committee, and what we learned from them uh, was that they thought there were lots of things we had going for us, including there were lots of volunteer uh, opportunities in libraries, but their barriers they foresaw for us were, um, number one, that there might be staff resistance, and I'm sure many of you uh, experience that periodically. And secondly, libraries in California, at least, are uh, parts of their city or county governments, and so many of them are unionized, and everybody was concerned that the union issues would get in the way. So we were, I, we knew that up front, we were able to plan for it, come up with some um, materials and resources to help people through those, uh, and that was very beneficial to what we did the rest of the time. Um, the champions piece and the pilots piece was critical to our effort, and I think it would be um, to most of you, and that is we started with folks who really wanted to try this. They wanted to take on this idea of skilled volunteers and test some things, and the beauty of that is they not only learned it and created processes, but then they were able to help us carry the message out to the rest of the field. So it wasn't just me at the State Library saying, here, I know this is going to work. Just try it. Just try this skilled volunteer thing. We were able to un unleash these uh, folks from across the state who had actually implemented the things we were talking about. And they, by the time we got to our training, actually, they had examples they could share and, and show the enthusiasm that they were feeling for the project. So that was, uh, that was another critical piece. Of course, we, you need to have management support at the top. Um, that was true here at the State Library, but it was also true for the public libraries themselves. So when we invited people to training, we invited them to bring a team of people, and we required that a, that a top manager be present at the training. It could be the library director or another senior manager, but we felt it was critical that in order for these folks to get trained and go back to try some implementation, they'd have to have management support from the get-go. And that was a that was a, a also a critical piece. I um, highly recommend that. We know that having assigned staff to volunteer engagement is really important, but it's also true that very few public libraries have a full-time uh, volunteer coordinator. So we encourage those who didn't to find a piece of somebody who could serve in that role, so that we were dealing with uh, somebody who's part of, at least part of their job uh, was related to this, and that we could help them move information through their organizations by having somebody whose job it was to do that, whether they were full-time or not. And as I said, most of them were not. Um, we know that identifying clear, meaningful volunteer roles is so important. If we can't articulate to the potential volunteers out there not only what the job is, but what they might gain from it in terms of learning new skills or sharing skills or uh, you know whatever the benefits of the job are, um, that, that we're not going to be as successful. So that was critical. Um, and we cast, wanted them to cast a wide net. Many of you, I'm sure, been in libraries, and you know they've got that sign on the front desk that says volunteer here. And we wanted to help people understand that there's a lot more ways to recruit volunteers than that. That, that might be a good one, but let's reach out beyond and cast a wide net to find new people who may have, maybe haven't been in a library for a long time and don't know how it's different from what it was when they were a child or when they're, they're uh, it's not their grandmother's library anymore, and we wanted 
can bring new people in uh, to see that, and also because of our subversive goal of turning those folks into library supporters, we wanted to reach out beyond the known suspects, not just library users, but beyond that to people who might come in and understand uh, what we do and also bring skills to us that we didn't already have. And then I want, I think a really important thing is to measure results, and I have a whole slide for that, so Jennifer, you can uh, move on. So I can show you sort of how we've been able to show people that this has been successful. And I think as, as you listen to this, think about ways that you could, um, that people would respect the kinds of results you've had. What should you measure in order for people to see that this is successful? Uh, when we first started, uh, we thought our goal was to get 50 libraries on board in the first year, uh, and we were blown away. We got double that in the first year, and then by year two, we had 84% of the libraries statewide participating. And I think a lot of this had to do with the fact that we had management support from the top. Our state librarian was very interested in this, made sure she spoke about it uh, at meetings she attended all around the state. Um, and then, as I said, we had senior management involved in the training aspect of what we were doing. So that word, that helped the word spread. Um, we've seen a 52% increase in library volunteers in California in the first five years of the project. And that's based on a survey that's done annually by the state that the, the information goes back to the feds. So it's a very credible uh, way for us to show that we've made an impact. And you may have some kind of annual survey or something you could use to build on that would give you that, um, that foot in the door. We have this uh, statewide partnership with Volunteer Match, and at any given time, we have uh, over 800 library volunteer opportunities posted on it, and over 700 referrals uh, come to a library in California each month from Volunteer Match, uh, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and then we have, I'm able to, through the data I get from Volunteer Match, I'm able to survey the people who uh, signed up through Volunteer Match to, through our library hub, uh, and I found that one of our goals is met, and that is that 79% of them are, this is their first time volunteering for a library. I know the volunteers I'm getting here at the state library through this process, uh, many of them didn't even know there was a state library, and it's becoming a really powerful um, tool for us to reach out to people who didn't know we were here, or maybe thought we were something, we were their grandmother's library. I also asked those folks in the survey, um, you know, what, what else have you done besides doing the, um, the volunteer job that you came to do, is there anything else that, that you've been up to? And as you can see, 60% of the people um, have told friends about the library services that they found, and of course they've all found something new here, uh, which is great, they're out telling people in the community about that, and 30% of them are recruiting volunteers for us, so that, that is pretty awesome. Uh, it also asks them beyond that, and we're finding that some of them actually have spoken to uh, legislators or local decision makers about libraries uh, and have even given money to libraries as a result of their volunteer engagement. So we're feeling like we're, we are moving people from volunteers to library supporters and that's been very gratifying to see. Um, I just wanted to show you on the next slide some of the kinds of new skilled volunteer roles libraries are implementing. Uh, during the recession, of course, people were sent to libraries to fill out job applications. Many of them had never had their hands on a mouse before. Uh, and so we immediately geared up programs all over the state where we recruited folks to be job center coaches or computer tutors or both to help people um, access the services they needed to access online. Uh, libraries have also recruited professional event planners and graphic designers. Um, we have a large statewide adult literacy program in libraries, and we've reached out uh, beyond our usual sub suspects for those folks. And some volunteers are even being promoted to coordinate programs where maybe other volunteers do the work, uh, do the work, and they make sure that the volunteers have the resources they need and keep in touch with them. Uh, most recently, I've been successful in recruiting an awesome public relations specialist, and just just last week, a social media specialist to help us promote what we're doing uh, in libraries. So that's been uh, very gratifying and fun to see how libraries have thought through strategically what different ways they could use volunteers beyond the ways that they are, have been traditionally uh, involved in doing that. So what does the project leader need to do? I, like many of you, I'm assuming this is not my full-time job. I, I wear another number of other hats in the state library. That's true for um, most of our libraries, the people who are operating this. They are 
not full-time in volunteer engagement, it's a portion of their job, and I'm betting that for many of you out there that you're in a similar position. Uh, but I think we can look at sort of the, the, the roles that have to be taken on by somebody in order to make things successful. Uh, and I wanted to just touch on a few of them that we, um, that we talked about uh, in the article, in the, the chapter, so you can see how they might uh, be implemented where you are. Um, first of all, uh, somebody's got to be the cheerleader, and that's, that's a role that I played. And interestingly, I got a whole bunch more people on board to help me play it, because it takes more than one, uh, one cheerleader to make it happen. That's another role of those um, pilot libraries or those champion folks that you bring on board uh, initially. Um, engaging leadership, it, again, is critical. And, and now I mean not just engaging management, but engaging additional people who can play a leadership role. So in my case, I live in a very large state. This is a part of my job. So I reached out to people that I saw out in the field who were um, you know, bubbling up as champions or interested in this and were having some successes. Uh, and I reached out to them and asked them to play various leadership roles. And, and that has the dual um, uh, impact of not just gaining additional leadership for the program, but also recognizing the skills and the leadership abilities of those people that you bring in. So it, it's an awesome way to say thank you, as well as an awesome way to get more uh, information shared out there. We started with, and I, I assume you will after your advisory piece like we did, start with some kind of a training event. Um, we needed to train libraries in skilled volunteer engagement, in new ways of to do volunteer recruitment. Uh, and so we held a two and a half day institute um, where folks were brought in as teams, as I mentioned, with uh, uh, some volunteers and some staff, as well as a key manager uh, in the, the training team. And we really got people on board at this high quality training. But it, it doesn't stop then, because what we found is that you got to keep talking to people. you got to keep bringing new information. You have to keep sharing um, more things. So we've created a listserv and a website and a um, we do webinars periodically uh, for folks. Um, I do little online meetings where I give people a tour of how Volunteer Match works, just to help keep folks on board and keep them using the tools and the resources that we have available to us. Um, and uh, oh, I had some other brilliant point I was going to make and lost it instantly. Um, but the the point is, oh, trade turnover. I, you may have the same kind of thing that we have. Lots of people turn over, particularly over a five-year period, which is how long we've been doing this. We've lost some people and had to bring new people on board. So this year, we've been going out around the state and doing a one-day institute with those leaders from the field I mentioned. I got brought some people together. We created a one-day workshop, and we're going out and doing this in seven different places around the state. And again, requiring them to bring a team, including a senior manager. Um, I wanted to just talk briefly about the resource piece, and that is um, we've provided some uh, resources to folks. As time went on, we began to see what they were coming up with. They were coming up with amazing things, new handbooks, new applications, new policies, new procedures, new job descriptions for volunteers, new training programs. And so we have collected them and developed a, uh, the clearinghouse of sample materials that you see there um, where people can um, search for information they're interested in. It's a searchable database, and it's all materials that have been, not all, but most of it's created, materials created by libraries in the field who've been participating in this project. Um, and I, I've got, I think I have a chance to um, yeah. share it with Carla, you. would you like to, to show? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, how this works, and you're all welcome to do this. As I mentioned, to use this, as I mentioned, it's based on the materials that libraries have developed, but most of you know that a lot of these things are trans transformable into other types of organizations. So if you click on the management tools uh, section, then you can take a look at the keyword list, and let's say you're looking for, I get lots of calls from people who wonder about volunteer management systems. Management systems. What should I be using to keep track of my uh, volunteers. Well, what we have here is a consumer's guide to volunteer management systems, as well as some reviews that I ask libraries to do about the kind of uh, volunteer uh, management system they're using. There's also, let's say you need a new um, teen volunteer application, you click on that keyword and tons of them pop up, and you, all you have to do is click 
on one, and the document is there, so you can use it uh, in whatever way you want. You can look at a number of them and decide which pieces of the application are things that you need for your organization. So that's really all I wanted to um, show you there. Um, but just to, to know that it's available, we also post um, every month we add new things to it, so you can look at the things that have just been added, or you can go and see things all the way back five years that we've added each time. Uh, and also here are position descriptions as a way for us to help libraries think about what kinds of volunteer, skilled volunteer positions they might put together. And so we've all stored them here, and just like the other one, you click on it, and it's in the library concierge position at the Roseville Library that you can look at and see if that might work for you. So that's what I wanted to, to share there, Jennifer, so you're Great. to take back the screen. Uh, thank you so much, Carla, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and let's see, um, pull this up, and I know we've got some great questions coming in. Um, I'm going to do my best to try to keep us more general rather than specific today, since uh, we are sort of talking about what kinds of changes you can make that can influence or really pay off in your ability to engage volunteers in either skills-based work or that mission-driven, um, impact-driven work. And my first question to you ladies is, both of you talk so much about how important it is to work with your champions or to start with pilot programs. If I wanted to start to think about implementing some of these program changes or really moving needles, how should I go about finding those champions or starting those conversations uh, in my, inside my organization or with stakeholders? Well, this is Carla. One of the ways we did it um, statewide, of course, was, you know, I couldn't possibly know everybody. So we actually sent out a call for people who wanted to be on the advisory committee. And when we did that, people came out of the woodwork with all kinds of backgrounds and volunteer engagement. We had some volunteers apply as well, which was great, some managers. Uh, and so we put that list together and created an advisory committee that was representative of all those types of folks. And through that work, we began to see who might be the um, the ones who who were really excited about it and wanted to move forward, and then they helped us find others. So that's how we started. Yeah. Um, I I would I would certainly echo what Carla said. I think that um, you know if you put the invitation out there, either through a statewide initiative, through an application process, through a information forum. Um, it's amazing who shows up, um, and that's your first screening opportunity to see who are the people whose eyes literally and figuratively light up at the opportunity to be part of change, and then use those people as your connectors to others. Um, we've seen you know, a selective process be really important in that you can put the invitation out, but if you only have capacity to really support small number of efforts, then make it a selective process so people don't um, uh, you know, come with the expectation that they're guaranteed to be part of it. Um, uh, and the other thing I'd say is that the word pilot is really a very magical word. <laughs> um, it's very intentional um, every time we use it because a pilot means you have permission to change. It means it's not a, a done deal with change being rolled out overnight, um, that it's slow and incremental, and um, it attracts those who are comfortable with that in-betweenness of not having something to be set in stone um, and rules already written, but those who want to be part of it. So I think your language and, um, and an invitation are really important. Great. Um, so we have a couple of questions. I'm going to try to put them together into maybe a two-parter question. Um, both of you talked about 
managing expectations or setting reasonable expectations, revisiting those expectations. Um, and Jen Nelson asks, uh, with these changes and giving volunteers these more strategic roles, how can you sort of um, modify your expectations or um, make sure that they're committing enough time to make that worthwhile or accomplishable. Uh, since this requires more planning and more supervision from the manager, uh, how, how do you start to talk about volunteering differently? And then that second part of that question is, um, what do you do or say or how do you approach your existing volunteers um, or your older volunteers to make sure that they're involved in this process and not so resistant to that change? <laughs> and feel free to start wherever you want. <laughs> I take a stab at the first part? Yeah. Okay, I take a stab at the second part. So go ahead. Okay, so let me take a stab at the first one, which if I recall was about how do we manage expectations, hold volunteers accountable to these new types of strategic roles. Um, it's, and, and, how, and, and there was a statement in there about the staff needs to supervise so, um, so the most important step is is that expectation setting, and that revolves around not only how you're going to work together, but what are the results your partnership between staff and volunteer, skilled volunteer leaders, um, are. What are the what are the results that work is striving to achieve? So. We're very big advocates of developing work plans around the work that define very clearly what are the results we're seeking. Is it increased you know, attendance or use of the library? Is it increased learning among students? Is it um, uh, higher patient satisfaction rating at a hospital? Um, is it, is, you know, what, whatever the outcomes are, better technology, more efficient, whatever it is, a, a successful event with a certain amount of funds raised, what are those expectations? And that is absolutely something that the organization can drive, but that volunteers should have a stake in helping to define, because anyone, volunteers included, are more invested in achieving results they have a stake in defining. And then the key piece is that once your outcomes are defined, in a work plan, your immediate impact, main outcomes, vision for the project. The staff, when you're engaging skilled volunteers, staff, staff shift their role from being supervisors to instead being supporters and allowing and supporting the volunteers in defining what are the steps that are going to get them there. And for the staff, it's about letting go of supervising and managing every step along the way and instead ending every meeting with what do you need from me in order to be successful? And that shifts your role to one of the supporter and all the things that Carla laid out, resource getter, you know, problem solver, all of those and shifts you into a supporting role. Um, and the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Carla is that, you know, letting go of how the work gets done doesn't mean letting go of knowing what's happening and being able to hold people accountable. So part of the agreement early on is how are we going to keep in touch with each other? What's the best way to communicate? Email, in person, phone, um, you know, online workspaces, whatever it is, how are we going to keep in touch so that I have no surprises and that I can support you every step of the way. And that if you have problems, we won't find out after it's too late. We can work together to solve them. Yeah, and Carla? This is Carla. I'm just going to add on to that with an example of I, I recruited a, um, a public relations specialist, somebody to help I create a statewide public relations campaign around the 30th anniversary of our library literacy program. And because what I want to be sure is if the people understand, I don't think it takes more time to supervise or support these folks. It just gets different. It's just a different approach. In this case, he was the expert. I don't know anything about public relations, but I understood what our goals were, and I understood what we were trying to accomplish. And you know, we actually met in person only three times, and spent lots of time on um, on conference calls and, and 
and other calls because he was guiding me and came up with amazing things that we never would have thought of. Uh, so I just want to say again that it's not so much uh, spending time supervising, it's spending time um, working with, supporting, you know, following through, providing resources and that, that, uh, to those high skilled uh, volunteers. That's been very, actually very exciting uh, for me and for others to do. And, and on the second part of the question, if I got it right, is I think there's a concern, and there certainly were among library folks, oftentimes a concern when we talk about implementing the skilled volunteer piece that the traditional volunteers will feel badly or get their nose bent out of shape or feel like they've been pushed aside. And I, I would say to you that that, that certainly doesn't have to happen. There's, there are very traditional roles in libraries that continue to be um, open to volunteers to, to do. And actually what we've offered them is opportunities to add to what they're doing with another level of skill volunteer. For example, you all are familiar with library book sales and the volunteers who help sort the books and sell them, etc. And we started talking to them about, well, maybe you could find a volunteer merchandising expert who could help you display things better, uh, particularly for those libraries that have a little bookstore inside the library in addition to the, the large book sale. So we're, we present it to them in terms of what they can gain from this and what additional kinds of volunteers they might be able to engage in their work. Uh, so, so we haven't, we don't, we're not seeing sort of the tra traditional volunteers going away. We're seeing additional volunteers in terms of skilled volunteers being added to what we're doing throughout the organization. And another way to help people with that is to engage volunteers in the initial training. So we asked each library to bring at least one volunteer with them to the training. And as you get, you might guess, many of them were very experienced and sometimes older and volunteers doing traditional work. And they got excited about what they saw the possibilities could be as well. So I, I think the key is not to make people feel like we're replacing something with this. I think we're, we're just, this is another amazing tool you can add to your toolkit uh, to get even more results for the organization in terms of not just volunteer engagement and getting more work done, but bringing a new kind of uh, volunteer into the system who then cares about your organization. And as I showed in our case, they go out and tell people about it and even recruit more volunteers to help. So um, I hope that answers that question, Jen. Great, yes, and sorry to throw such a complex, <laughs> multiple question at the two of you. Um, <clears throat> a question from Missy, it sounds like in her organization, um, prior to the last year or so, there was an expectation that um, the leadership and roles of volunteers would be moving towards that skills-based, um, impact-driven work. Uh, but uh, and previously they were sort of engaged as partners with staff. And there's been a shift in leadership or a shift in culture. And now they are, in quotes, only volunteers um, with few opportunities for input. Um, what would you suggest to Missy to help her educate, inform, change the mind of, their current, of her current leadership um, about how uh, engagement and volunteers can really move needles in your organization? Well, yeah. This is Carla, and two things came to my mind. One is to show them results. You know, show them, take them somewhere and show them what volunteers are doing, or show them uh, the new project that we've been able to implement because of the way we've approached uh, volunteering. Um, secondly, I'd say take them to training if you can, or get them engaged in some training. And thirdly, there's actually a book, um, and I'm going to hopefully it's going to come to my mind. Maybe one of you out there, I'll look for it in a minute. Uh, I can send it out. Are you talking about From the Top Down by Susan Ellis? From the Top Down, yes. Yeah. That, that's a great book for um, leaders and executive type folks who don't get it. Um, if you could get them a copy of it and, and help them, you know, maybe engage them in a conversation about it, uh, it's, it's a great book to have. And I'll just add very briefly, I mean, first of all, it's a great question and it's one I get very frequently um, from volunteer engagement professionals who are at workshops and training say, yeah, I get this, but I wish you could talk to my CEO or my board chair because they're not on board yet. Um, so you're, you're not alone, so I would also connect with others in your community um, and see what works in your own community and see the CEOs talk to other CEOs. Um, and, and the other thing I'll add is that outwardly for research that's out there, um, and there's tons of it, and we can you know, supply some of it we, we've already some of these today, and there's others through volunteer maps and through service enterprise initiatives, a lot of data out there about the impact and return on investment, dollar-wise, on investing in skilled volunteer engagement. There's more data than ever. 
ever out there. But I think that's especially powerful when it's shared with data from your own organization, whether it's case studies and success stories, like Carla mentioned, or assessments of your current and potential volunteers, surveys, information about what they're seeking, what skills they have that aren't being shared with the organization, that they'd be willing to share with the organization. Um, you know, a little internal research will go a long way to show how the external research can apply and how there's room in your own organization to tap some of these volunteers. Great. Thank you, ladies. We're getting close to the top of the hour. I wanted to just uh, mention that while we've got so many great questions today, um, we are, are limited on time. But the good news is both Beth and Carla have written about 4,000 words on these topics. And they are in our book, which you can uh, see information up there about where to find it or who else is included. Um, uh, if you did not get questions answered, um, again, we will be sending out a recording of today's session. You'll receive that in a follow-up email. If you'd like, you're welcome to sort of craft a more complete question. I'd be happy to point you in the right direction. And um, I'm sure both Beth and Carla have resources they could share as well. So please do feel free to reach out. You can contact me by clicking reply to any of your GoToWebinar reminders. And with the last couple of minutes, um, ladies, any key takeaways or one sort of learning lesson that you think uh, ties your chapter to today's topic of, of you know, how small changes or changes in volunteer engagement can really pay off in, in that strategy? much for your time today and for contributing to the book and talking about this and being inspirational. And um, again, uh, you all will receive this recording and a later an email that's sent out later. Um, thank you again for joining us and a giant thank you to Beth Steinhorn and Carla Lane. And we hope to see you on a future webinar. Thanks every everybody. Bye-bye.